Hi and thanks for watching. Today I'm going to show you how to use the Monte Carlo simulation module that I built into my apartment acquisition model. Now the genesis of this project was an interesting thesis that was shared with me by one of our readers entitled Beyond DCF Analysis and Real Estate Financial Modeling, Probabilistic Evaluation of Real Estate Ventures. And it was written by Keith Chin Ki Lung as part of his Master's in Real Estate Studies at MIT. Now this form of analysis I had done before in a portfolio theory class in my graduate studies, but I had never incorporated or applied it to my real estate analysis. And so the thesis was a great framework from which to build my first stochastic modeling module or Monte Carlo simulation module, which is what I'm showing you today. Now for those who don't know, a Monte Carlo simulation is used to model the probability of different outcomes. Uh, also known as stochastic modeling, it layers in probability into your assumptions so that every time you recalculate your work, workbook, you get a different outcome. And then after running thousands of outcomes, you can analyze the data, look at what's the average outcome, what's the minimum outcome, what's the maximum outcome, what's the standard deviation of our outcomes. And when I say outcome, I'm talking typically returns or I might be talking some risk met, met, metric that we use, etc. Now the module is housed in this tab, Monte Carlo, and there is a uh, drop-down menu in the upper right, a val data validation list that you can turn the module off. And if you turn it off, this becomes a deterministic model. Deterministic model is the type of typical DCF model that we use where there's no randomness. We as real estate professionals, uh, we use our our experience, our intuition, our best guess based on data that we have to input a set of assumptions and those assumptions lead to an outcome. And so we turn off the probability in this upper right hand corner, but then we turn it back on. And what happens is we layer in probability to certain assumptions. Now, these are for the most part growth rate assumptions, growth rate in rent, growth in, in other income, operating expenses, capital expenditures, re releasing costs, terminal cap rate, as well as probability in days vacant between leases and renewal probability. And how this works, let me use rent as an example. First, I'm going to turn off stochastic modeling. And these are our standard assumptions. We assume that rent will grow at 2% per year. That's a pretty typical uh, assumption out in the industry right now. And so what that means is each year, there's some growth. And you might have a, a more sophisticated model where maybe you, you have the ability to alter what you assume your growth rate is going to be in any given year. Nonetheless, it's your best guess and it's input and it's static once you've, you've placed that assumption. What this does when we turn sto stochastic modeling on is our yearly growth in this, in this case of rent is a probability. Okay? And so you'll notice 2% is our baseline, but in this uh, scenario that was just run, these are our, our uh, rent growth rates. We recalculate and they change. And every time we recalculate, they will change and they'll, they'll be different. Right now, the probability of what happens here is based on a uniform basis. I'm going to turn this first to normal. And let me show you how we alter this. So first, we have our base uh, rent growth rate. This is 2% and this draws from the property summary menu there or a tab. There's a question, what is, what do you think uh, rent growth is today or what's kind of a baseline, your typical rent growth right now in the market. So we put 2%. Then we have the ability to put a floor and a ceiling for rent growth, meaning throughout the term rent growth will never be less than this, this or more than that. Finally, and this is where the probability comes in, we are going to set a standard deviation and a mean for the change in growth rate. Now what I mean by change in growth rate is we have this, uh, our baseline growth rate, right, that 2%. And what this is going to do is it's going to, it's going to add a probability to how much we're adjusting from that baseline. And so in year one, for instance, this is where we use a RAND function to lower our base, baseline growth rate from 2% minus 0.86% so that we get a 1.14%. Year two then, 2.4, that's the probability that came out of the engine, and that's added to the previous year's growth rate. So that the growth rate in year two is actually 3.54. It's actually 1.54% above the baseline because 2.4% was added to it 
um, based on our randomness. Now, the value that comes out here is a probability on a normal uh, on a normal curve, right? So how this looks, let me bring this over so you can see. We're going to put a mean for our probability, and that's 0.1. That's this center line right here is 0.1%. So the most likely outcome for this value is 0.1%. And if 0.1% is output here, year one's growth would be 2% plus 0.1% or 2.1%. Okay, that is the most likely outcome. That is our mean. And then it asks standard deviation. And this really is how, how wide of a swing could possibly occur here. I'm going to put 1%. And what that means is if we come over to our chart, here's our one standard deviation right here. There is a, a 15 plus 19 plus 19 plus 15, or a 68% probability that the outcome for this cell is somewhere between 1.1% and negative 0.9% or 0.1 minus 1%. So, so there's a 68% probability that this value is going to fall between those two values. And then this is added to this to give us our year one. And then the same thing happens in year two. This added to this gives us year two. Year three, this added to this gives us year three and so forth. So you, as you're filling out your model, you'll need to set a floor and a ceiling for where rent growth could go. And then the change in rent growth, which is driven by probabilities, you're going to give us a mean and a standard deviation for the distribution of values that will then lead to your rent growth. And it's the same for other income, operating expenses, capital expenditures, and so forth. The only one that doesn't require any in, uh, inputs for now, <clears throat> uh, I've, I've set some default inputs for days between uh, days vacant between leases and renewal, bill, renewal probability. Now you can come in and change these, and that's why I left these blue, where you have a minimum, that's the floor, maximum, that's the max, and then standard deviation seven, mean flows over from the rent roll tab. And so what this, set, what this tells us, standard deviation of seven means there's a 68% probability that the expected days vacant between leases is between 13 and 27. 20 minus seven gives us 13, 20 plus seven is 27. That is 68% pro probability it'll fall in between those. And then for renewal probability, similar setup. Floor, ceiling, standard deviation, mean, and that gives us our expected. And then of course, if we recalculate, it'll change each time, okay? That is how the normal distribution works. The outcome again, each time we recalculate, we get different growth rates for each of these, different assumptions for days vacant and renewal probability, and as a result, the outcome, which if we go over to property summary, changes. So right now we have unlevered IRR 8.54. If we recalculate, that becomes 11.23. If we re recalculate, 10.24, etc. Let me also show you, if you prefer to use uniform, now I prefer normal because I feel like it's more in line with what happens in the real world, where outcomes tend to fall on a bell curve. Nonetheless, you might want to use uniform for simplicity's sake, and it's pretty simple. So uniform, again, let me bring this over so you can see. Uniform means that your probability is going to fall somewhere on this line, and there's an equal probability. So if, if it's between A and B, there's an equal probability that it'll be anywhere on this line. And so if we come over here to our model, for rent growth, it's a similar logic where we take that baseline rent, we add some growth change in a growth rate factor, and we come up with our growth rate, uh, rent growth rate in this case, for each year. And how this value is determined is it's a uniform distribution, uh, probability distribution between negative two and two, meaning there's an equal probability that this value will be negative two, negative 1.99, negative 1.88, et cetera, all the way to 2%. That's, there's an equal probability of that happening. And then that value is added to this value, giving us year one. This is added to this, giving us year two, and so forth. And so once we've set our probabilities, and I've set them up here in a way that I think makes sense. So uh, in practice, how would this work? Well, 
we think that over the next 10 years, it's unlikely that rent will grow by a factor of less than 1.5% or negative 1.5%. So we think there there's a possibility that rent would fall, but we don't think it'll fall by more than 1.5%. We also don't think that rent will grow by more than 6%. So that's kind of putting a governor, if you will, on how much rent growth the model is using. And then here, our standard deviation and mean, what we're saying is we think there's a uh, we think there's a likelihood, because we've set this above zero, we think there's a likelihood that rent growth rate will increase above the baseline that we're seeing right now. We think that uh, over the term, things are going to improve. Nonetheless, because there's probability, that may not happen. But it increases the likelihood of that happening. And then the standard deviation, it's really, what's the volatility in that? What, uh, how uncertain or certain are we about where rent is going? And so the smaller this value, the less uh, we're going to move away from the baseline. The higher this value, the more uh, volatile or, or more variation there will be away from this baseline here. So once you've set your probability assumptions, and we have the rest of the assumptions built into the model with our property summary, rent roll, operating expenses, we finish here and we want to run our Monte Carlo. Now keep in mind what's going to happen when I click this button. There is a macro that I've built that is going to use two data tables to run 10,000 iterations or, or 10,000 calculations of this exact model. One for internal rate of return and the other to calculate our net present value. And that's going to take some time. Depending on your processing power, on my computer it takes about uh, three or four minutes and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this button I'm going to pause the video and then I'll bring you back when it's done I'm gonna put a timer up though next to us so that we can track how long it took uh, me to do this run so you can get kind of a feel for how long this takes so let me pull over a timer the timers here so I'm gonna click this timer button and then I'm going to hit uh, run Monte Carlo and we'll see what happens So as soon as we hit Run Monte Carlo, there is a dialog box that jumps here. It says, Running 10,000 Monte Carlo simulations, please be patient. This box here is only open when Monte Carlo simulations are being run. Okay, And you'll also know because your cursor turns into, well, on a PC at least, it turns into that thinking uh, bar, or in this case, a circle. So I'm going to pause the video, and we'll come back when uh, we hit finish the, the uh simulations. So the simulation completed. Now you know it's done because first off this box should be green. That means it was fully run. Uh, this box will go away. So uh, and then the last run uh, will will uh, tell you basically when it finished, right? Uh, if we look at our alarm clock, it took 2 minutes and 22 seconds to run uh, that Monte Carlo. And the results are interesting. So first we're going to look at NPV. Uh, we're using a discount rate of 7.5%. The base, and what the base is, this is the deterministic model. That's the model without probability. And the NPV of that base model, uh, the model where, again, we don't have probability, is 9.5 million. But with Monte Carlo, when we take into account all of the outcomes and we look at what the average of all those outcomes is, there are nearly a million more. And so this could be a really valuable tool if you think about it. Uh, if you believe in the assumptions that you're inputting into your probability, what this is telling you is, sure, uh, on a deterministic basis, 9.5 million is our NPV. No, I'm sorry, present value. Our present value is 9.5 on, on, uh, on the base, but it's 10.5 for the Monte Carlo. And that just tells us that uh, there is there's more, and you'll see it here in the distribution, there's more outcomes above than below uh, our, you know, kind of our, our NPV of zero. Okay. Now, so we're looking at present value. When we subtract out the purchase price, we get our NPV, our net present value. And what we want is we want this to be positive, and the base is negative. Yet the uh, Monte Carlo simulation gives us a positive. And so uh, it means that either potentially this this asset is worth more than the marketplace thinks it's worth and or uh, this may give, give us the ability to win out uh, against other, um, let's say that this goes to 
goes to bid against multiple purchasers, uh, we could win because we're we're willing to pay a little bit more because we think there's more value here than maybe your your standard DCF model is telling you. The other thing that this gives us is a probability of a positive NPV, and it says 58.8% of outcomes were were above a zero, so uh, above where we want where we want it to be to, for this to make uh, investment sense. Then we look at our minimum net present value. And again, we want this to be zero in order, if it's zero or above, we would do this investment. Our minimum NPV is this, our maximum is that. Obviously in the base, it's the same because this is uh, you know, one set of outcomes. Um, but what this tells us is there's a lot more upside than there is downside in this. Um, and you see that over here in our minimum IRR and maximum IRR, where we have this base IRR here, we have our average or our expected IRR based on the Monte Carlo, which is by the way, quite a bit higher than the base. Um, but there's a lot of upside relative to the downside. The other thing we notice is <clears throat> standard deviations, uh, the, the volatility in the outcomes is actually reasonably low. Uh, I like to look at this return per unit of risk metric. And what this is, is, is your, um, your, in this case, average, uh, your expected return or your average IRR divided by the standard deviation. What this says is um, for one, one unit of risk, uh, this is how many units of return that you get. And the higher this value is, uh, the better the risk-adjusted return is. Next, the module includes some graphs to get, get, give you a picture of where the distributions fall. Now, this is a scatter plot, meaning every single outcome, all 10,000, are plotted on here. And it becomes a line, right? Because, um, because uh, in, in, in the real world, when there's probability and things, they tend to fall on a bell curve. Well, th this is uh, a cumulative distribution or, or the form that um, normal curve takes when it's cumulative. And you'll see, again, this is zero NPV, and we want more things on the right. You also see that because of kind of this, um, would that be a convex view, but uh, the sloping up and then back down tells us there's a, there's a lot of outcomes, 58.8% on the, on the higher side, uh, fewer on the lower side. We also get an NPV by probability. So again, this is using a, a bell curve here. Uh, this is, there's a 34% probability that your NPV will fall within these values, 34% probability that will fall within these values, 14 here, 14 here. 2% on either side. So there's a 2% probability that it'll be greater than 4.4 million, at least based on our, our assumptions here, and a 2% probability that it'll be less than a negative 3.2 million, uh, the NPV. And then again, uh, the, per, this provides results for IRR. We looked at those just a minute ago, including minimum and maximum IRR outcomes. Uh, it plots the different outcomes on a curve here. And then uh, this plots out by between uh, different values, uh, how the distributions came, and you'll notice that there are more uh, above the this base, and that's why you get this value higher than than this. There there are more outcomes above the base uh, than below the base, and as a result, again, the average. Uh, become 7.75 or quite a bit higher than the base. What that tells us is there's more upside in this than our, our deterministic, our simplistic DCF model is, is telling us. So that is the uh, Monte Carlo simulation module that I built for my apartment acquisition model. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, again, this is kind of my first stab at this. Um, there are certainly better ways to do this. If you find an error or, or if you have any comments on this, I'd love to hear from you. And thanks for your time.